Hello and welcome at Book Lovers Companion. My name is Edith and right next to me is my lovely co-host, The Chattering Teacup. Hello. And here with us from Canada, Mark Angelo. Hello, Mark, and welcome at Book Lovers Companion. Hi, great to be with you. <laughs> It's lovely to have you on our show all the way from Canada, like I said, dear listeners. And we are here to talk about maybe both of your books, if you would like. But first of all, we would like to talk about Can We Play Baseball, Mr. DeMille? It's a lovely book, a lovely drawings, a wonderful story. And of course, it is a very personal book, is it not? It's a true story? It is, Edith. Yeah, it's a story that, uh, you know, I have great memories about. It's a story that's close to my heart. Uh, and I think in a lot of ways, uh, when you look at the state of the world right now, I think it's a very timely story. Uh, you know, I wrote it uh, thinking that and believing that it, it was a fun, uh, an uplifting story. There were elements of nostalgia in it, going back to a, a simpler time. There's even a bit of a, an environmental message I can mm -hmm. talk about a little later. Mm -hmm. But it is a true story. Uh, it's from my childhood. It's a story that my brother and I often laughed about. And uh, <laughs> Uh, and it tells of a, a young boy uh, and, and his friends and their love of a game. In this case, it's baseball, but you look around the world, it could be a love for any particular game or any particular sport. Uh, and it centers on their very difficult search for a place to play ball, uh, which in turn led to this incredible encounter with a, a Hollywood legend. Uh, and I think it's the kind of story that a lot of children can identify with. It's about a shy, determined young kid And many of us were that way, especially when we were young. Uh, but also, I think it's a story for, for parents in a lot of ways that it will get them thinking back to their own childhood. Uh, and hopefully they'll smile in the process. We did smile. Definitely, yeah. And you said it's your love. It's also about your love of baseball. Uh, tell us a little bit about baseball, because we know nothing about baseball. We know what it looks like, but... That's yeah, about it. That's it. <laughs> well, you know, for this book, you don't have to be a baseball fan to uh, appreciate yeah. it. Because once again, it could be really about any sport yeah. or any game. But for me, uh, baseball is a game I always loved uh, as a little boy. Uh, the book was written in 1958 at a time when the Los Angeles Dodgers had just come to town. They used to be in the eastern part of the country and they decided to relocate to the west coast and they moved to Los Angeles And the whole city was incredibly excited, especially young ones like myself. Uh, in terms of the game of baseball, you know, like any major sport, there's lots of wonderful aspects to it. Uh, I always loved the aesthetic of the game. I loved mm -hmm. the strategy. I, I loved even attending games and being in the midst of a cheering crowd. And whether you go to a soccer game or whatever, you know, it, it, it's wonderful to be in the midst of a cheering crowd. Uh, for baseball, I always loved the sounds of the game. You know, if you were to watch a, a game up close, you know, there, there's some incredible sounds. The sound mm -hmm. of a ball hitting a wooden bat, you know, I, I always loved. The smack of the ball when it hit the glove or, or the sound of a runner sliding into home. Uh, it's a sport that has an incredible history, once again, like most major sports do. Mm -hmm. And I even loved the ballparks. I, I used to go watch the Dodgers play. And uh, I just loved being in these big ballparks. <laughs> I thought they were like cathedrals almost, you know. They had a, a feeling of magic about them. And uh, so uh, for lots of reasons, uh, I love baseball. But once again, you know, this book really and the messages in it, it could apply to uh, a child's love for any sport. Mm. It's about, like you said, it's, it's a more than just baseball. I mean, not just baseball. It could be any other sport, but still, it's about being a child and having a sort of, you said it, teacup. How, what did you call it, the, the feeling you get when you read the book? It, it's, it's, a, it's a nice feeling and it's, it seems like it's like an idyllic childhood. In simpler times, without any problems. It probably wasn't like that, but you get a feeling it was. Yeah, it does cast you back to a, a simpler time. I mean, any time, I mean, we often look back at, at our childhood. We'll look back in an era, sometimes with rose-colored glasses, and we forget that there were challenges then too. But in a lot of ways, you're right. It, it was a simpler time. Uh, 
I think the book has a lot of different elements to it. Uh, you know, on one hand, it centers around a child's tenacity, you know, a desire to, to play and to try and do anything to, to make that happen. Uh, it centers on a, a kid's ability to overcome his nervousness and finally approaching, you know, Mr. DeMille in, in this case. <laughs> You know, it speaks to the value of, of neighborhood friends. You know, all of us probably had childhoods where mm. there were a group of kids that we hung out with a lot, that we played with a lot, and they were a big part of our lives, you know, when we were really young. Uh, there are lots of elements of nostalgia when you read this book, uh, even the tone of the illustrations. It's, uh, it also speaks to old Hollywood mm. You know, the Mr. DeMille was an icon in, quote, old mm. Hollywood. And, uh, but another key message in it that's really important to me is that it also speaks to the, the importance of nearby outdoor spaces to play. Uh, you know, I think that's, uh, that's really important, especially in cities. You know, uh, you know, I look at our city right now and, you know, the extent to which it's developing, the extent to which it's densifying and holding on to outdoor spaces nearby accessible outdoor spaces for kids to play any sport or just to go and run around and spend time outside. Those kinds of things are really important. So, so that's a key element in the story as well. Mm. I often see children or teenagers hanging around maybe shopping centers or something like that. And it was a, it's a bit annoying, but there's no place for them to go. As you say, they, there should be more green green spaces where they can run around or hang out and so on. No, I, I agree with you. Uh, it's interesting. We just had an article in our local paper about Vancouver and uh, the extent of the development going on and how much nearby green space has been lost in the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, and I think, you know, that's the case in, in many cities. Uh, in, in some cities, it's just uh, doing what you can to hold on to the green space you can't, you have. You know, thinking that as more development occurs, you know, more and more will be lost. Uh, but it's interesting today, um, uh, you know, I look at our, our own grandchildren as an example and, and their love of, of personal screens, you know, their interest in screen time. And it's not just kids or grandkids. It's, you know, everybody. We all spend a lot more time on computers in front of screens these days. That's a, a fact of life. And, and I know for our, ki our grandkids, I appreciate why they do that because, you know, screens can be incredibly captivating. The, you know, the, the modern video games, which didn't exist when I was young, are, are captivating in many, many ways. But I also think for anyone, especially children, you have to, to balance that screen time with, with time spent outdoors. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think getting outside and, and running around or playing or simply going for a walk, I just think is, is so important. And, uh, And for children, playing outside, I think, does. It makes us all happier and uh, it makes us all healthier without question. Mm. Yeah. Especially when you think of how to behave in a group or how to be learn how to behave with friends, how to become maybe also a better person because you are not the most important one because you have to also uh, think about your friends, how they feel. And how do yeah. you learn that? Not in front of a screen. Yeah, you have to be part of a group. Yeah. Interacting with people. That's so important. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I was on uh, our public transportation recently and, you know, I, I just was standing. I couldn't get a seat and I was just looking uh, uh, at, at people around me and we were all side by side, but everybody was on their phone. And, you know, there was literally nothing in the way of, of interaction between people. And I just thought that's, that's really interesting. We've all developed that ability to kind of isolate ourselves with our phone. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you kind of miss out on that, that interaction. And, uh, yeah. you know, I think we've all seen scenes as well where you go to a restaurant and there mm -hmm. might be a group of people around a table. And rather than interact with each other, you know, uh, regularly, many of them are on their phones kind yeah. of doing their thing. So, uh, I just agree. Being uh, in an outdoor environment, playing with your kids, in this case, you know, a group of kids that loved a particular sport and the kind of interactions that occurred, uh, those are really positive. I mean, that reminds me of a concert we attended years ago. Do you remember yeah, yeah. the Cindy mm -hmm. Lauper concert? There was oh. this 
Um, Girls just want to have fun. fun. Exactly. I know. It's and it was at uh, at the Opera House in Vienna. I've never been to the Opera. Just saw uh, only once. Only once. <laughs> I have to admit, the listeners. Yes, I'm not uh, an opera fan. But anyway, uh, the the concert took place in the opera, and we had a nice seat and full house. I mean, come on, Cindy Lauper, she's fantastic. And oh yeah. Um, in 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 the audience, there was at least one person who um, got a little bit on her nerves because instead of being present, he or she I don't can't say if it was a man or a woman. He was he or she was constantly using his phone to record to it. record it to take pictures, and she re she really said to this person, "Please put away the phone. Just be here. Enjoy it now." Yeah. And Instead not of later. Yeah, exactly. Being the moment. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a very, very valid point, you know. So, uh, so certainly this story, it does center around not only desire to find a place to play ball, but, but I, I remember so fondly the, the interactions I had on an ongoing basis with our group of friends mm -hmm. and how much of our life centered around going out together as a group and playing ball. But just being outside and playing with a group of friends at that age, I, I think, is priceless. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to have adventures with your friends. That's true. I mean, you know, you uh, it, playing ball, but it could be any kind of yeah. adventure. <laughs> yes, you know? exactly. It, the adventures are in your head. You're running around a green uh, in a green park, whatever, mm -hmm. and actually, you're I don't know, riding your horse on the prairie or something mm. like that. But <laughs> You and enjoy it, it yeah, and you remember it. Exactly. And the stick becomes a sword and so on. Exactly. Exactly. We were pretty creative back then. <laughs> It's interesting that you say riding horses. Um, <laughs> C.B. DeMille, uh, his granddaughter, one of the wonderful things about this book is I've struck up a relationship with his mm -hmm. granddaughter and we communicate regularly. Mm -hmm. And she remembers those days uh, just as I do. She remembers <laughs> the backyard, the DeMille backyard. Just as I do, she remembers the hole in the hedge that we crawled through. Uh, but we were exchanging notes the other day, and she said, in the same way that we loved playing baseball in his backyard, she would bring all her friends together, and she would gallop. At the, the field had a mild slope to it, and she remembers, and I love this line, galloping down the slope with all her friends on imagined horses, which I thought was so cute. You remember the, 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 the broomstick and the yeah. horse heads that we had when, and she and her friends would gallop down this slope and mm -hmm. pretend, you know, that they're riding. And, uh, but we all had incredible, uh, we, we were very creative. We had great imaginations uh, yeah. back okay. then. And I'd like to think, hopefully we still do. Yeah, I think so. I mean, like, like you said, teacup, You have to use your own imagination. You don't get it on a screen or uh, already there from someone else's yeah, mind. It, it wasn't work to do that. It's just, oh. It just was. Yeah. You created these worlds. Exactly. But tell us about Mr. DeMille. I mean, you've <laughs> met him in person. So, I mean, like you said, he was and, he was and still is this huge icon. Yeah, and how frightening was it yeah. to walk to his door? <laughs> well, it was frightening for me. Uh, Uh, you know, C.B. DeMille, uh, an amazing man. And if you look up his history, it's quite incredible. He was the, the founding father. He is the founding father of American cinema. Yeah. Uh, he had a great career both in silent films and talking films. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in 1914, he made the first full-length feature in, in Hollywood, uh, a movie called The Squaw Man. I think you could argue he is perhaps the, the most commercially successful producer, director in film mm -hmm. history. Um, I think many people have seen his films. Uh, you know, The Greatest Show on Earth was a, a circus film that came out in 1952 that I grew to love. Mm -hmm. uh, his film, the, the Ten Commandments, uh, it still plays every holiday season. You still see it. Yeah, uh, even here in Europe. Most, sorry to interrupt. Oh. Even here in Europe. They broadcast it also here from time to time. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, he was quite incredible, very successful, but most people knew him in a very formal way through mm -hmm. his work. But this book does put a much more, uh, it puts a very human face 
on him from the the perspective of a, a young boy, a shy, nervous young boy <laughs> who had never met him before. Uh, and I have to say that singular direct encounter I had with him was was unforgettable. But I also remember just as well the nervousness I had in leading up to that encounter. And it's interesting, as you see in the book, when all of the kids decided, you know, I, I had suggested, <laughs> why don't we go and talk to Mr. DeMille? Well, everybody was nervous about doing that, you know, because obviously he was a very famous person. He's yeah. a person that... Nobody had ever met before uh, amongst our kids anyway. Yeah. And while everybody agreed to do that, but when we got up to the, the foot of the stairs, none of them wanted to go. And in effect, I got deputized and <laughs> I ended up going on my own. And uh, so I put on my trusty Dodger cap. I, I, I gulped a few times <laughs> and I slowly, slowly, you know, made it up the stairs uh, but even I remember pushing that doorbell. I was so hesitant to do it. And when I finally did it, it was <laughs> my heart was beating, you know, uh, gosh, I don't know, 200 times a minute or something <laughs> like that. And who was more intimidating in the first moment, the butler or Mr. DeMille? Yeah. Well, when the door opened, you know, I was nervous as it was. But when I met the butler, <laughs> and he did have, I, I say in the book, I remember it so well, he had the deepest voice and, uh, and he was large. Now, mind you, I was quite small, but uh, uh, when he opened the door, I was, uh, yeah, I was very nervous about him as well. But anyway, I said, as I stayed in the book, I told him why I had come and, and he said, Mr. DeMille was, was not available. And I tried again and he said, I'm sorry, Mr. DeMille is not available. And I said, thank you. And I turned to walk away. And then I heard that voice in the background show the young man in. And uh, <laughs> and then I thought, wow, did I really do the right thing in coming here? <laughs> But uh, anyway, I turned around and uh, once again, the butler just kind of led me in and, and the rest of the encounter is is detailed in the book. But But I remember it so well. It was so many years ago and yet I remember it like it was just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. What I found interesting is that he seemed to live in a normal neighborhood, even though he was that famous. Because nowadays I have the feeling that famous people live apart from regular yeah. people. Well, it's interesting that you say that because, I mean, I loved the neighborhood we lived in. You know, it was, it was a beautiful neighborhood. And his house, as I mentioned in the book, was spectacular. It was the largest house I had ever seen. But back then... Uh, None of the roads were gated. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't a, a closed, isolated community. You know, my friends, if they wanted to come over to my uh, to my house or, you know, they could just bike up the street. I mean, the, there were no gates. You know, mm -hmm. there were no kind of obstacles to the movement of people. Whereas now, and I think it's just a sign of the times, unfortunately, but you do see more and more communities that are gated, that are isolated, that, uh, you know, are separated. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, And I understand perhaps why that's the case, but it's also unfortunate to see more and more of that. Also in Canada, in Vancouver, where you live? Not so much where I live, in Canada, mm -hmm. no. But, uh, but I do go back to Los Angeles, you know, and, and other cities in the States and gated communities in, in some big American cities, and particularly in places like greater Los Angeles, mm -hmm. are a fact of life now. But we, don't, we do not have as much of that here. Mm -hmm. We have very little of that here in uh, in Vancouver or Canada, for that matter. Is it is it due to <laughs> maybe it is probably to the crime rate in the United States compared to Canada? It might be, you know. That's uh, but I do know security is probably a, a major reason behind the push for gated mm. communities, particularly in in some of the the more expensive parts uh, uh, of the city. And uh, But once again, when I was young, that did not exist. You mm. know, there were no gates and, uh, uh, and pretty much everything was accessible. And that was one of the, the great things about that era. You know, there wasn't a, a perceived need mm -hmm. for or, or, or not the same um, concern about security as mm. there is now. When did that change in your estimation? Oh, gosh. You know, I, I think... Uh, You know, it was a pretty innocent world in a lot of ways. It wasn't a perfect world by any means, mm. but in, in the 50s, it was a pretty innocent world in, in lots of ways. 
but you know, getting into the sixties and seventies and eighties and, and perhaps even more so now, uh, you know, things have changed. So things like security, things like, you know, violent crime, uh, those things are more prevalent now than, than used to be the case. Certainly. Mm. As you said, uh, it were innocent times and children back then had an innocent childhood, at least most of them. Um, do you think it's still possible for children to have an innocent childhood now? I think it's more difficult and more challenging, you know, when you look at the, you know, the access to the internet, uh, Uh, you know, you look at, at media that's out there, you know, in those simpler times when I grew up, for instance, uh, uh, I still remember getting our first television set. You know, I, I, <laughs> I still remember, I mean, it was a very different world. And when we did get a TV set, we only had three channels. You know, now there are hundreds of channels. It's, uh, um, but that said, I, I, I don't know if it's possible for a child, nor is it even desirable for a child to have too innocent mm -hmm. a childhood. But I, I do think that children can have largely innocent childhoods and, and live life as it was meant to be for a child. Uh, I do think, you know, parents have a huge influence on that. I think schools have a huge influence on mm -hmm. that. Uh, you know, in the bottom line, uh, gosh, I, I look at our grandchildren. I'm so proud of them. <laughs> and uh, they're, uh, uh, they're growing up to, on one hand, be cognizant of all the, the pressures and the threats that are out there, the reality of society in a lot of ways. But on the other hand, they're really good kids that are leading a wonderful, wonderful childhood. Uh, uh, and I'm so happy to see that. So yeah, I do think that's possible. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, a few years ago, mm -hmm. I was in inspired by our grandkids to start writing children's books because I'm such a believer in getting good messaging out to kids. Mm -hmm. So much of my life, I've focused on communicating with older audiences, with university students, with post-secondary students, with, with adults. A lot of the articles that I've written have focused on older audiences. But watching our grandkids grow up, I, uh, I just think getting messaging like this out to kids is so important. My first book had very much an environmental focus, mm -hmm. once again, geared towards kids. And I have had the pleasure of, of dealing with and getting to know so many young children that are incredible in so many ways that that does make me optimistic about the future. Uh, I was a teacher for a long, long time. And I, and I look at a lot of the students that, that I taught that have gone on to do wonderful things. Uh, they make me optimistic, more optimistic about the future. So uh, we have challenging times in lots of ways, mm -hmm. but I'm still a great believer in youth. Mm. And aren't uh, children even more curious than older people? It's interesting that you say that. Uh, in some ways, I think, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, I talk to kids, uh, school groups, a lot of times uh, about uh, the environment, I take groups on, on tours of local creeks and streams. I talk about water and, mm -hmm. um, and their, their interest, the extent to which they're inquisitive, uh, the extent to which they ask questions, uh, their interest in environmental issues, once again, I find inspiring, uh, encouraging, uh, and once again, I, optimistic in that when it comes to the environment, they may well do in the end a much better job of caring for the environment than my generation did. Hmm. Interesting that you say that. And the book you are talking about, is it The Little Creek That Could? The first book I wrote was mm -hmm. called The Little Creek That Could. It's a story that uh, centers around a stream very close to where I am right now that 50 years ago was incredibly polluted. Hmm. It had been stripped of streamside vegetation. It, uh, it was filled with litter and debris and old furniture. It was literally a dead creek. And the story centers on our effort to turn it around. Uh, the book starts with an encounter I had with an elderly gentleman who mm -hmm. had lived at that location for 80 years. And this is going back 50 years ago when I first met him. He had lived there for 80 years prior. And I told him how sad I was to see that this creek had been so damaged and so polluted. And he responded by saying, son, it wasn't always this way. And then he proceeded to tell me stories about when he was a kid, how beautiful the creek was. 
you know, there were animals and fish and and I listened to him and I couldn't help but think, wouldn't it be neat if we could bring this creek back to what it once was? So we set out to try and do that. And this story chronicles the adventures and the efforts that we went through to bring this stream back to life. And this creek now, once again, is a beautiful, healthy, natural feature in the midst of our community. It is the little creek that could. And I happened uh, a few years ago to be sitting by the creek with our grandkids. And I was telling them this story that the place where, and we had actually gone down to the creek and we were sitting on a log. We had collected some worms in my, our backyard and we walked down to the creek and we were sitting on a log and we were throwing worms into the creek to feed the trout. We were watching the trout come up and eat the worms that we <laughs> threw into the pool. And I was telling my grandkids how polluted and damaged this stream once was and how neat it has been to see it come back to life. And my grandson, Tucker, he looked at me and he said, Bubba, that's their name for me. They, <laughs> they say, Bubba, you should write a children's book about that. And as soon as he said that, I thought, wow, I think I will. So, uh, you know, basically it was our own grandkids that inspired yeah. <laughs> me to write The Little Creek That Could. In the same way uh, that, you know, for the my newer book, Can We Play Baseball, Mr. DeMille, a few years ago, uh, in the early days of COVID, I went mm. down to visit my brother, and we were telling great stories from our youth, one of which was the DeMille baseball story. And my brother was quite ill at the time, and he said, Mark, you know, you should finally write that story. And my brother, unfortunately, passed away mm. just uh, a, few months out, a few months after that. Uh, but I came back to, to Vancouver and... Uh, and I wrote that. I've dedicated the Can We Play Baseball, Mr. DeMille, to my brother. But once again, it's a true story. that, uh, uh, And I think for, for any books uh, that I write and probably for the next book I write, I, I, I love writing about true stories. Hmm. And uh, that's a particular passion of mine. So it's just interesting. I'm sure with other authors you've talked to, it's interesting talking to them about what inspired them yep. to write a given book. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. what finally made them decide to do it. And in my case, uh, you know, those were, were two examples. Yeah, wonderful reasons to write those I books, think I think. Because, because it's true, it somehow makes it a bit more precious. Yeah, I, I, I do think there's a connection there. And, and one thing I loved about my first book, The Little Creek That Could, if you look at the, I love the illustrations, and mm -hmm. maybe I can talk about the illustrations yes, for both sure. my books yes, in a minute. Yes, please but, do. Uh, but when I wrote my, my first book, You'll notice on the very last page, there's an illustration that my grandson did. Oh. My grandson loves art, and he actually did the final illustration in the book. Mm. And, uh, it, and it's his image of what I must have been like <laughs> along a local creek when I was his age with my dad. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it's been a wonderful addition to, uh, to that book. But the illustrations in the first book, and I think for children's books, illustrations are so important. And mm -hmm. Roz Webb did the uh, uh, the watercolor illustrations for the Little Creek They Could. And, you know, it's when I wrote the book, it, uh, her style is very much in line with what I envisioned would work for that book. And I actually, you know, met Roz online. She is an illustrator and an artist that lives in Ireland. And we struck up this great relationship and, you know, would talk remotely uh, about these illustrations and worked as a team. But that's a wonderful thing about technology today, where you can strike up partnerships with people halfway around the world. Um, in terms of the illustrations for Can We Play Baseball, Mr. DeMille, those illustrations, uh, they're by Patricia and Robin DeWitt. They are artists that live in the eastern U.S., and I had seen examples of their work before. They did a book a few years back called uh, uh, Brave with Beauty, a, a Story of Af uh, Afghanistan. Mm. And I saw the illustrations and I loved their style. And I thought, wow, you know, their work could fit in really, it could fit in perfectly with what I envisioned for mm -hmm. the DeMille book uh, in that their work, it, it has a great feel to it. It's got a very nostalgic look, you mm -hmm. know, the work they did in, in this case. Uh, I love their choice of color. The colors uh, in this book are a little more muted, but once again, it helped to give it that nostalgic feel. Mm -hmm. They have a real knack 
for blending sometimes comical elements, but balancing that with a sense of realism and accuracy, which I thought was important in this book. For instance, the, the image of C.B. DeMille, Mr. DeMille, I wanted him to look like Mr. DeMille looked. Uh, and I thought they just did an incredible work and uh, an incredible job. They work in a variety of art forms, and they just have this passion for creating a, a intricate and captivating images. Like I said before, this looks absolutely lovely. And yeah. in this case, it's very important for the pictures to strike a note with the children. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I think for any children's book, particularly if you're targeting uh, a, a young age, illustrations are key because if a child buys a book or a parent buys a book, you know, first of all, they'll yep. be intrigued by the story, but illustrations could yep. be the deciding factor as to whether they, they buy that book or not. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And not just children, I have to say. because not, yeah. <laughs> But especially children if they can't read it. Yes, yes, that's true. Well, you know, I, I it's it's interesting that this book, uh, some of our own friends that do not have children, but are from that era, mm -hmm. have really enjoyed reading about the story too. Uh, yeah. And uh, and as I said, for and for parents when they read the book to kids, you know, if particularly if their child might be especially young and and not at that point where it can read, you know. Uh, not perhaps along with its reading advanced uh, enough and parents end up reading the story to them. Uh, I, I'd like to think it'll make parents smile as well. <laughs> There'll be messages in there that they can that yeah. resonate with them as well. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. And like you said, it's so important for parents to read to their children and um, to tell stories. And also it is so sad. I mean, it happened to us as well on occasion when we are on the, on, on a train or on the underground and people constantly constantly look at their mobile devices instead of interacting with their children they are so busy looking at their phones and ignoring their children and i once saw a father on the train which was interesting because uh you see that rarely these days and he had uh, a small rucksack for his son, and I think he was in kindergarten or pr primary school or something like that, and he had uh, a selection of books there. And he said, okay, you choose, and I will read it to you on the train. And uh, and I thought, that's nice for a change. Once in a while, while you see something. <laughs> yeah. And it's also sometimes, only very rarely, you see children just taking a book and read. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's lovely to see, okay, some still do it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, our kids and our grandkids, they love reading, which I'm so excited about. I, I just think to spend time reading books is wonderful. Uh, and uh, I think once kids get to be nine or 10 or 11, you know, I, I think some may get to a point where they drift away from books a yep. little bit, but parents can play an important role in trying to, to keep their interest in reading going. But uh, I remember when our kids were young, I used to love reading to our kids Uh, at the end of the day or before they went to bed. Uh, I know that our kids read to their kids uh, quite often. And it's a great opportunity for parents and children to connect, to interact. Uh, and, uh, you know, I remember when I was little, I have great memories of my parents when they read stories to me. So, yeah, yeah that's, uh, I think we should take advantage of that and try and do that whenever you can. Exactly. And sometimes it's, it's just a question of finding the right book. Because before we started the recording, you asked me about the beginning of our podcast and the friend I mentioned, he always said, oh, I didn't enjoy reading, you know, it was kind of boring until one of his school friends gave him a sort of graphic novel about adventures on the high seas. And from then on, he was hooked and he really yeah. enjoyed Uh, everything about adventurers, especially those going on ships and sailing the seas and so on. And that's what did it for him. But you have to If you start find the somewhere. right book. Yeah. Yeah. You find the right book. Kids develop a passion about following a certain book. And, you know, gosh, I, you know, I think of all the different kinds of books that our kids have read. <laughs> uh, if it's something they're passionate about and if the content hopefully is appropriate, <laughs> you know, uh, 
and and it inspires or encourages a child to read. I, I think that's wonderful. You know, I talk to our own grandkids or when I go to a school and mm-hmm. I talk to a group of young children and some of the questions I asked, you know, the, some of those questions are so sophisticated. The vocabulary <laughs> is so good. Uh, and a, a lot of them have vocabulary that's far beyond what I had at their age. And I'm sure a lot of that comes from reading, yep. the fact that they've developed this interest in reading. And uh, so I, I'm just a, a, yep. a real fan of that. And I love the fact that there are podcasts like yours out there, <laughs> a book lover's companion, you know, that talk about books that hopefully will encourage people to, to read even more. And uh, yeah. And I have to admit, dear listeners, we're also glad about this podcast because you have discovered so many authors which we wouldn't have discovered otherwise, especially those who are independently published authors. I think that's that's wonderful, you know, that uh, uh, to profile authors like that, you know, I mean, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to talk to you as well. Uh, <laughs> so it's, do we. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, I look at this story and, uh, you know, my, my hope is that, uh, not only my first book, but uh, Can We Play Baseball, Mr. DeMille as well, that it's a, a story that a, a lot of children will identify with. Uh, it is about, does center on a kid's, a child's desire to play, his determination, his nervousness that he had to overcome. And I think all of us at some point in our lives mm-hmm. had a great degree of nervousness yep. before a particular event or or before we had to approach somebody or yep. somebody we wanted to talk to. But for parents, uh, yeah, my hope is it'll cast them back to a simpler time, to those years in their mm-hmm. youth, when their summer centered on playing with friends. And uh, those were pretty special times that certainly make me smile. <laughs> uh, uh, as, as far as my overall objective of the book, you know, basically I wanted to produce a fun book with some good messaging in it. Uh, something that parents could read aloud mm-hmm. with their children uh, and after and uh, after which that hopefully they could have a bit of a conversation mm-hmm. about the story. Uh, and I think that's a, a wonderful thing about reading with your kids too. If you can read them a book or read them a story and then hopefully have a bit of a discussion about mm-hmm. it. Uh, mm-hmm. Just a, a great opportunity for parents and children to interact and communicate. You said it's important uh, uh, that children not only read, but not at home, not only at home, but also schools have a, a role to play. Do you think that it should be more important for schools to focus on things like reading, writing, uh, instead of handling all those electronic devices? Mm. Because I think there is a reason why All those Silicon Valley CEOs and the employees send their kids to schools where they do not use those devices. All the time. All the time, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. I, I think of uh, children today, you know, to feel comfortable with devices, to have a knowledge of them, I think is really important. But, you know, I'm, I'm just such a believer in the importance of reading and, and writing and communicating because whatever you do in life, communicating is always mm-hmm. a key aspect of it. Uh, uh, and I, I think that if you can communicate well, if you can express yourself well, uh, I think that will open lots of doors mm-hmm. for, for anybody as life goes on. And a, a lot of those skills can be developed by reading. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the other thing I, I just want to mention, uh, Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I know that I often read on a computer or a tablet or whatever, but for me, and maybe this is a reflection of the era that I grew up on, but I love a real book, having an actual real book in my hands and to be able to turn the pages. There's something about that that simply can't be replaced. And it's part of the wonderful experience attached to reading, to actually hold that book. And, uh, Yeah, so that's something I hope is uh, is never lost. And another thing, with electronic devices, being an e-book reader or a tablet, um, you have these covers, oh. and the covers somehow reflect a book. So I guess m- more more people than you um, have that feeling. Yep. Yeah, because I mean, when you pick up a book, and I know for uh, the the two books, the children's books that I've written. 
you know, the covers I think are really important in terms of engaging people and attracting people. And when you actually have a book in your hand and you can look at the cover, uh, it's not quite the same when yeah. you just scroll through the cover image on a yeah. tablet. Uh, Exactly. Uh, and you, you can never remember, we spoke about it on and on, you can never remember the title or the author when you read it on a Kindle or on a tablet. But when you, when you have a book, you always look at the book cover and you always see the title, you, mm -hmm. always, you always see the author and with a Kindle, oh, I'm reading this book, um, uh, I don't know the title, the author, I can't remember. Yes. <laughs> No, you're so right. And that's a lot easier to remember when you actually have had a book, a tangible thing in your hand. Uh, and by the way, I love, I'm looking at your image behind you and I love the bookcase that you have there with all of those books. I think that's wonderful. That's a wonderful feature in a room to, to be able to have a room like that. Yeah, it's not the real one, but the real one is downstairs. So it's not, not, not really fake. Oh, but it, it looks, it looks wonderful. <laughs> In, in my opinion, there's only one problem with printed books, and it's when you run out of space. Yep. That's true. Yep. No, Otherwise, that, that's very true. It's perfect. Yeah, that's the problem. And here we are. We can't, we can't build a, a library. I mean, there's not enough space. I mean, we like, need you, an Alex. like, yeah, exactly. But like you said, we have to be careful what we do to our environment. Yeah. And I think, in terms of, you know, a lack of space for the tangible, real books that you do have to be selective about, you know, those that you buy, those that you collect. But also if, if you do run out of space, you know, there are often other people, you know, that will be interested in those books. We have a series of free libraries in a lot of our neighborhoods where people will take books to these little free library stands on the corner And then neighbors can sit there and take a book and borrow it and read it. And then they return it to this freestanding little library. And we've got a network of those, you know, in neighborhoods across our city. And uh, that's been wonderful, too, in yep. terms of mm -hmm. allowing other people to get access, you know, yep. to books that yep. you may have already read, but you may not have room to, to store yourself. And exchange books, for example, we have, you probably have them as well. We use yeah. old telephone boxes, for example, in Vienna sometimes for people. Yeah, in the fifth district, they have this old telephone box where you can put books you have already read or, or something like that. And you can put it there and people can take them and put something else there. So a sort of yeah. exchange yeah. library. Sometimes they only use a yeah. shelf for that. Yeah. 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 yeah, those kinds of things are wonderful. Yeah. Exactly. And also, I mean, bookshops are important. I mean, independent bookshops, it was a problem during the pandemic. They had a lot of problems. Some had problems, others didn't have problems. And going to those, to those huge uh, chains, for example, in Vienna, the last time I went to this um, huge bookstore and I was wondering, uh, where are the books? There was a lot of, of merchandise, you know, all and, kinds and, of, yeah. of gifts, stuff, stationery. Yes, it, but, but where are the books? Yeah, yeah, and you're right. That's part of their marketing plan and uh, their, uh, their, their economic strategy that, you know, they do focus a lot on merchandise, perhaps as much so as they do books. So, yeah, yeah that's a good observation. I mean, I do understand that uh, Amazon is a huge problems for bookshops but still i mean independent bookshops for example in the in the united kingdom they are thriving at least some some of them and here they, they are exchanging books for like we said merchandise i mean come on yeah yeah no it, it's interesting uh, uh but some of those small independent bookstores are fascinating places to go into And, uh, and wonderful, uh, wonderful places to, to go into. Uh, uh, you know, we were on a trip in Portland not too long ago and in the downtown area, the, the old town part of Portland, I walked into this large bookstore and, uh, oh, it was just fascinating. I kind of, I could explore the shelves for hours. It was, uh, it was wonderful and mainly books but they also had a section on National Geographics and they had National Geographics going back to like 1899. And uh, I just uh, 
Anyway, it had a wonderful feel to it. I could have explored it for hours and hours and hours. The first way for me when we are in London is to a bookshop. Good for you. Yes, yeah. and I have never enough time. She always puts me there. The teacup puts me there and she does her tea things. And <laughs> you, you, yeah, I, then I go to the bookshop. Yeah, shop. little Edith is in the bookshop and has time to explore. Never enough time because two hours later she's back and I haven't <laughs> even started. I mean, oh, I think that's great. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. The only problem is we have to carry it back. Yeah, that's the only problem. Yeah, yeah, indeed. <laughs> You know, that that's the only problem. And that's always a problem when we go to events because we went to events in the UK where it's all about books. And yes, usually we come back with loads of books. And even longer lists of uh, books, <laughs> books we to want buy. to read. Yeah, we want to read, we want to buy and so on. Yeah, well, what can one do? Uh, Mark, oh. what is your advice for other authors? children's book authors. I think if, if you want to write a child's book, you know, write a story that, uh, that you're passionate about yourself, you know, because your own passion will be reflected in the story that, that you write. The, uh, uh, certainly, as we talked earlier, giving thoughts to illustrations, you know, that, I think that's important. Giving thought to the kind of messaging, you know, what's the kind of prominent message you want to get across in your book? It's, um, But, you know, I think the, the idea of writing children's books, uh, it gives me such pleasure. It's a relatively new aspect for me because, as I said, most of my career I focused on, on writing and communicating with, with older audiences. And, uh, and I've totally enjoyed the experience of writing my two children's books and, and dealing with, with children and, you know, dealing with programs like yours. It's been, it's been such a, a great experience. So I, I think writing for children, putting together a children's book can be such a rewarding experience. So if people are inclined to do that, they have an interest in doing that, uh, I, I certainly encourage them. And may we ask about your future plans? Well, I, I will do one more book. You know, I'm, I'm working on a, I do some film related work as well, you know, pertaining to rivers and uh, streams and the environment. Uh, I have a project like that underway now that probably won't be out for another year, year and a half. But I also, in the coming months, I, I hope to start on, on one more book, one more story I want to tell for children that I'm quite excited about. Uh, it will have an environmental focus. And, uh, so that's something I hope, uh, I've already kind of crafted an outline, but that's something I hope to get into in a bigger way in the fall. You said this project of yours, this uh, film project, It's not with Netflix, is it? No, no. <laughs> we're, we're, we're in the process, though, of uh, uh, we'll be finalizing a distributor for it sometime mm. in, the, in the next uh, three or four months. Mm. So we've got preliminary funding. We've started work on it. And uh, so in, in the coming six or seven or eight months, we'll focus on the completion of fil filming and, and then finalizing uh, a, an option for film distribution. Mm. Okay, I'm just asking because, you know, who knows? Maybe <laughs> they're losing too much money these days. Who knows? Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, so we, we don't have a, a, firm, uh, a firm plan yet on how we're going to distribute <laughs> okay. it. You said illustrations are important, especially with children's books, especially for the younger, for the younger ones. And I have again to say that not just yeah. for the children it's important, Because I have to admit that the most recent book I bought in German, it's been a long time since I bought it, I bought it because of the cover. Not just oh, not, not just the blurb on the back, but also because of the cover and the illustrations. Yeah. The illustrations, yes, they are they are lovely. And how shall I say? Yes, it it, it has a cat on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, well, good for you. I can understand that. <laughs> But you know, it's interesting what you say about covers, cover design, and not just for children's books, but for any book. Cover design is another, sometimes uh, that, that's something that's not always appreciated to the extent that it should be. But that can have a big influence too on somebody's decision to purchase a book or not. Yeah, or at least 
to influence picking to pick to pick the book up. Sorry, because there are lots of books in a bookshop, and in you walk if you walk past and the cover catches your eye, you pick it up and turn it around. If it doesn't, you don't. Yeah, and then you won't buy it. No, do you do you think very valid point? Yeah, do you think that visuals regarding covers? For children are more universal than for adults. I'm always think, you know, mm. Tikap. I'm always thinking about um, this crime novel by Marihana. Mm -hmm. You have this, uh, you have this European uh, edition, which is perfectly all right in my in my opinion. Then you have the, I have sorry to say that uh, the listeners from the United States, this United States edition, and there is a silhouette of a woman in high heels a short skirt and a weapon in her hand. I mean, British police, no. <laughs> well, you know, from my experience with covers, we gave a lot of thought to, you know, the covers that we would select, uh, that we finalized, that we went with. Uh, most importantly, I wanted them to be a reflection of the story. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to be images that I thought were, were attractive Uh, and colorful, mm -hmm. uh, reflected the story, uh, something that uh, both a child and a parent would look at mm -hmm. and say, hey, this looks really mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the cover image, but even the title itself, mm -hmm. to, you know, giving thought to the actual title mm -hmm. of the book, mm -hmm. uh, another important element. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, um, the, uh, yeah, and I grappled with that a lot for both books as to what that would be. But in the end, I'm, I'm really happy with mm -hmm. both covers and mm -hmm. how they turned out. And I, I think they've, they've proved to be successful in terms of, you know, the intent, the objective in terms of attracting readers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, but you're right. For anybody that writes a book, those are things you have to give a lot of thought to. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, what astonish me, astonishes me all the time that if books are translated, mm -hmm. when books are translated, they usually also change the cover. And yeah, but you can't speak of a translation. I mean, from in, from British English to American English, there's another no, translation. Yeah, but from English to German. Yeah. And also the way covers are designed, the British mm. covers have a different way mm. uh, than the German covers. Mm. Completely, I can't explain it, but they look completely different in a way. And it seems that at least the publisher thinks that the images speak differently hmm. to different nations. Yeah, but is it... Different with children as well? With illustrations, I think maybe not so much, but with all the others. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, you know, uh, and a good point. You know, I would like to think, you know, ideally that, you know, a cover that works for a child in, in Canada will also work for a child, you know, in, in Germany uh, mm -hmm. or in England or, yeah. um, Uh, you know, maybe some will, will think differently, but, in, you know, in my view, I would like to think, for instance, the, the covers of, of the books that I've done will work anywhere. That's my hope. I think it will. I, I suppose. think so too, yeah, but absolutely. I don't know what publishers think. Yeah, publishers are yeah. different. But I think it is team. possible where you can design an image for a child's book that reflects what the story is all about but at the same time will be universal in its appeal yeah. to children everywhere. Yeah. That, that's yeah. my hope, and, and I must admit, that's my belief in a lot of ways. I think it will, absolutely. And it's a lovely mm. book. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I, I certainly uh, appreciate your interest, and, and what, uh, what, a joy it is, what a joy it is to talk to both of you. Mm. Same here. Can only agree. Uh, Mark, is there anything else you would like our listeners to know? No, I think we've covered, you know, a lot of ground, you know, it's just, uh, once again, it's a book and, and whether it be, can we play baseball, Mr. DeMille or my first book, uh, uh, the little Creek that could, I'd, I'd like to think that there, they are stories that will resonate with children anywhere, but also stories that I think, uh, you know, parents or adults will enjoy reading or reading to kids. That's my hope. And uh, if that's the way things turn out to be, then uh, uh, the books will have met my objective. Yeah, absolutely. Dear listeners, grandparents, parents, aunts and uncles, <laughs> take it up and read it to the little ones. They will absolutely enjoy it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, Mark, we will meet you in the green room. But thank you for joining us. 
Well, thank you both very much. Greatly appreciate your interest. You did enjoy this episode as much as we did? Then hit subscribe and don't miss the next episode. Also, make sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. If you like to support us and buy us a coffee, you can do so via Buy Me Coffee and other platforms. You can find all the necessary links in the description. Until next time.